we have a real treat for you today. But I want to read to you a little bit about this individual's biography. As I read it, I couldn't believe it. It was just so impressive, all that this individual had done throughout their life. Um, we're going to hear today from Dr. Story Musgrave, one of the most famous astronauts in the history of the United States NASA program. Dr. Musgrave was born on a dairy farm in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He was in the forests alone at age three, and by age five floated his homemade raft on the rivers. He rode combines, that's farm equipment, at age five, and drove trucks and tractors at age 10. In fact, I read a part of his story where he, a policeman saw a truck going down the road with no driver, and it pulled him over, and it was Story driving a truck at age 10, and he didn't get a ticket because he knew he was just trying to help his family. He repaired trucks by age 13. Story never finished school. He ran off to Korea with the U.S. Marines where he was an aircraft electrician and an engine mechanic. He started flying with the Marines and over the next 55 years accumulated 18,000 air miles in 160 different aircraft. He is a parachutist with over 800 free falls. He has seven graduate degrees in math, computers, chemistry, medicine, physiology, literature, and psychology. So if you think 12 certifications is a lot, he's got seven graduate degrees. He has been awarded 20 honorary doctorates. He was a part-time trauma surgeon during his 30 years as an astronaut. Story was an astronaut for NASA for over 30 years and flew on six space flight missions. He performed the first shuttle spacewalk on Challenger shuttle, its first flight. He was a pilot on an astronomy mission, conducted two classified Department of Defense missions, was the lead spacewalker on the Hubble telescope repair, um, on that repair mission. And on his last flight, he operated an electronic chip manufacturing satellite on Columbia. Today, he operates a palm, a palm farm in Orlando, a production company in Sydney, a sculpture company in Burbank, California. He's also a landscape architect, a concept artist with Walt Disney Imagineering, an innovator with Applied Minds, Inc., and a professor of design of art of, at Art Center College of Designs in Pasadena, California. Story also performs multimedia presentations on topics such as vision, leadership, motivation, safety, quality, innovation, creativity, design, and many others. He has seven beautiful children. Laura Lee, Scott, Holly, Todd, Jeff, Lane, and Story, ranging in age from age 48 to two years. He has three beautiful grandchildren and a beautiful wife, Amanda. Let's take a quick video look at some of Story's accomplishments. Yeah, we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 17 seconds and count. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 8, remaining start, start, 2, 1, Boost mission and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Well, for that, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Story Musgrave. Was scary. <laughs> wow, uh, so glad to be here. Gee, so I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, so, as uh, Lakeisha said, uh, life is a story. Where do you go? The opportunities, the experiences, and you just move through life one step at a time. And uh, I'm incredibly inspired by Akil, Abby, and, uh, and Shanice. That's a story, kids. I'm going to tell the same story you told, but I'm going to look at what happened to me, and I'm going to extract the lessons and the principles that I learned along the way that we can apply to what we do today. So I'm going to give you kind of uh, lessons of life. What is life? So the adventures of life. Talents. You come in the world with what your folks gave you, your basic DNA, your RNA, and you come in the world and that's who you made. And then you start acquiring the experiences, the education from the day you're born, maybe even when you're in the womb. You start being influenced by the environment, you know, the exposure that you get to life. And then you start building a skill set, who am I? So those are your experiences and your passions and your dreams then lead you a long life. So, it's what done on August 10th? What you gonna do on August 10th? Today on August 9th, you look in the mirror, you say, who am I? What is my skill sets? What am I good at? And then you say, on August 10th, my passion and my dreams gonna lead me to what opportunities I want to take on. What doors are going to open for me? A door opens and you jump in, and that's like a playing field. You get dropped on a playing field. It's a new game, a new playing field. What are the rules of this game? What do I need to know? What the skills, what proficiencies, do the details to get to the finish line, which is the challenge of that opportunity? So every opportunity, every new thing you take on in life, you say, Here's the challenge to get to my finish line on this playing field. That's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about passions, opportunities, challenges, and how you get to your desired finish line. That's what it's about today. And I'm looking at the clock out there, and thank you so much for the extra 10 minutes you, you came up with. Otherwise, it's just terrific. Now, okay, right off, you see that airplane? That airplane's a playing field. That airplane NASA gave to me just to maintain my skills as an aerospace operator, the checklist, the procedures, being the best you can. All you kids, I admire you kids that got up. I just can't believe it, Abby. So where's the kid? Where are you? See, I got a pick on it. So you're over there. Where's your niece? Okay, you're all kind of, the, okay, there you are. One, two, three, so I'll pick on you along the way. I'm just gonna echo, <clears throat> I'm gonna echo, echo what you said here today. And so you said, be the best you can all the time. You're being the best you can every second of the day. So we're gonna talk about excellence, excellence. And the more you put into life, the more you get out of it and the better you get. That airplane, you see, NASA, it's a huge privilege. They just gave me the airplane to keep me sharp as a professional. Checklist procedures being the best that I can in that world. So, that airplane there, that's like an example of a playing field for you all. It's me and that air airplane, what am I going to do with it? How good can I be? What kind of a professional can I be? So, right off on slide one, there's your example. That is a playing field. It's an opportunity. It's a challenge. Me and be the best that you can. That is the posture of exploration. As serious as my stuff is, I gotta loosen you up. We're gonna have fun. You know, fun is the most important word to leave with my message. 
if you're not having fun in life, turn that life in and get a new one. You got one. You must have fun, but also fun guarantees you'll do it well. Fun will guarantee that you're in the game and you will do it well. So <clears throat> that is the posture of exploration. That is me 78 years ago. On 78 years ago on my dairy farm in western Massachusetts. So I was born into nature. But the lesson there is, is you take a three-year-old and you drop any three-year-old anywhere and they're in the game. They're saying, give it to me, baby. Come on, world, give it to me. There's nothing there. There's some cockroach, there's some stick, there's some stone, but the kid's in the game. Whatever you do in life, stay in the game. I am excited about what the world is given to. Give it to me, baby. I'm here, and I want you. Teach me, educate me, give me some experience. So you're in the game, and you're learning. So that's me, like I said, on the dairy farm. Now, that is my front yard you see right there. That's my front yard, Western Massachusetts. That's the world I was born into. I was in the pine forest alone at the age of three at night. How could mom do this? There's nothing. There's nothing going to hurt you. The pine forest is going to look after you. So I was an exploration right from the very start. Now, this is my front yard, and we're looking. That's the house. The house is looking down to the river. And on the left-hand side, it's a new photo, so it was clear. But the farm, the farm used to look down to the river too. So there's a hill floating from the house down to the river and the barn down to the river. Now at the age of seven, I want to be a big, I want to be, I don't, I want to do what adults do at the age of seven. So I'm all by myself. I jump on this tractor. I jump on this tractor and I'm pretending I'm driving a tractor. Some of you know tractors. Well, I hit the brake. When you push on the brake on a tractor, you release the little ratcheting lock. So I'm sitting on this tractor, I'm pretending, and now the tractor's rolling because I released the brake on. It's rolling down to the river. That's the hill, you know. And there's nothing I can do about the tractor, and the tractor goes in the river. So I just float off to sea, and the tractor sinks into the river. Now, my father, uh, i got to say it, he was not a nice man under any circumstances. <laughs> and when he passed on, I said, the world finally got rid of that guy. I know that's nasty, but I'm giving you my life, okay? That's the way life was. But he's going to be less nice with this condition. Now, I'm stupid, and it's a stupid thing, but I'm not dumb enough to tell them that I did this. <laughs> he beaten up on a farm hands for having lost the tractor somewhere in 500 acres and not been able to find it. Well, three days go by, and I got to do something. So this is my life, folks. For seven, I'm seven years old, and I got to survive life. And my whole 80-some years of life, I've been trying to survive one playing field after another, but I got a tough one this time. I need to tell them where the tractor is without telling them I put it there. So that's a difficult issue. I'm looking at the wooden lawn furniture. Wooden lawn furniture, look at the river. Ah, I went down to the farm. I got a chain, and I chained the lawn furniture to the tractor. So the lawn furniture is floating in the river. And my father sees this, you know, my goodness, what's going on here in life? But he got to go get the furniture back. He goes to get the furniture back. He can't. It's chained to something. So that's why I showed him where the tractor was without telling him that I did this. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, that's life, folks. Life is figure it out. You got to learn how to figure stuff out, you know, and get it done. And so that's my whole life. I'll figure it out and get it done and keep moving. Keep moving down the road to August 10th. So I survived that. He beat up on the farm hands, and they knew darn well who did it, but there's no evidence. So I'm okay with that one there. <laughs> so, yes, that's a new, that's a hay baler in 1943. Uh, so the hay baler in 1943 would not tie the knots. So it's tying a, tying a knot, a twine knot is a very difficult thing to do in 1943. So they're very creative on the farm, but they can't get the baler to tie the knots. But they do have, they are creative enough, they put an eight-year-old, you see, there's a bench right there. They put an eight-year-old on a bench, and if the baler does not tie the knot, the eight-year-old got a needle-nose pliers and ties the, ties the twine knot. 
So I, at the age of eight, am tying knots in a baler. If I don't get my hands out of there the next cycle, I'm going to leave my hands in there. And so the dust is so thick, I can't even see my own hands. There's no mass, there's no respirator, and that's what I do. And I also have to look downstream. The tractor going down there, if a bale is rolled the wrong direction, I have to run ahead, roll the bale out of the tractor's way, get back, and keep doing the knots. So whose story must great? I am a product of child labor. <laughs> that's who I am. I am two things. I'm a product of child labor, and I'm a teenage Marine. That's who I am, and that's who I've been my whole life, and it's how I got where I got. So, that's how it worked. Now, <clears throat> I drove everything at the age of nine, and they didn't give me any instruction. They just told me, go do it. Just go do that. Get that job done. So I got to figure it out on myself. I'm learning how to figure stuff out. I'm learning how to get the job done. And so as Craig said, yep, it's driving down the highway with his truck and the state police stop it because they can't see ahead. There's nobody driving, open the door. Young man, you can't be 16. No, sir, I'm 12. Be careful, son. They know it doesn't help to give a ticket to a kid. The kid doesn't know what a ticket is. The kid will be driving the next day, but they also know that the farm is going to go under. Well, despite my good efforts, my farm went under anyway. So at the age of 16, the farm went under. And we're building the Massachusetts Turnpike. And so I went and got a job at the age of 16 as an oiler. That is every, at four in the morning, every grease fitting and do the fluids. So that's all, it's a grease monkey is what you are. But I learned mechanics. I learned mechanics when I was a child. Now it's a very important lesson. You take up the piano at age five or at 50, there's a massive difference. You ask someone, you know, when did you take up skiing before I could walk? When you take up some skill when you're very young, it becomes part of you. You're getting wired, and you get wired by those challenges and by those skills. So I had the mechanics in my heart and my soul. And so I advanced rather rapidly. I got into some other stuff with this construction, this heavy construction. But the lesson I got for you is 40 years after that picture, that hand and a ratchet wrench will be 400 miles in the air, your lead mechanic to work on Hubble Space Telescope. That's a lesson I got for you. Don't you ever forget what skills you acquired. Don't you ever forget your certifications. Don't you ever forget what you're good at. Leverage everything you ever did. Leverage that into your future. It will play a part. You can say the grease monkey not going anywhere. I'm telling you where the grease monkey going. That's to work on a telescope. There is luck involved, yes. I ended up having a great machine to work on. I could have worked on all kinds of machines. But we're going to see how that path turned out. Well, I never did finish school. The bus left me off at the barn, picked me up at the barn. I had no homework. I had no books. I was incompatible with school. We finished the Massachusetts Turnpike. So I have no education, and I also have no job. So it's the next step, right? It's like August 10th for y'all. What are we going to do on August 10th? OK, I joined the Marines. And that was a neat way. I joined the Marines at 16. I lied about my age. You know, I really wasn't very sophisticated. It's like the government doesn't know when I was born or where I was born. It didn't occur to me I won't get away with this. They weren't very happy they had to send me home because they can't send a 16-year-old to Korea. So they, they like my spirit, though. Just come back a year later. So I joined the Marines at 17. That is my base in K-6 Korea. Now, the Marines are going to make me a mechanic. I'm already a mechanic. I'm an incredibly skilled mechanic. It's part of my heart, part of my soul. That's my air base. That's K-6 Korea that you're looking at right there. Now, this is, this is what it looked like. It's very, very primitive. This is the very early 50s in Korea. Uh, so it's very essential and very primitive. I do not celebrate war. We've got to get over war. We've got to stop doing that. The species needs to get along with itself and get along in sustainable behavior and look after the only spaceship we're going to have, which is Mother Earth. But I do celebrate the military spirit. 
I am military, the get the job done at all costs. Figure it out and get that job done. The spirit of getting it done, the spirit of discipline, education, technology. So I do love the military way. But like I said, don't celebrate war. But it's me and Korea. That's how primitive we were. Those the big cannons lock in. We were fantastically inaccurate with the bombs. You know, the bombs, you just had red switches. You threw the red switch and the bombs fell off. They just fell off the airplane. Nothing was guided, nothing was smart. You know, this is, this is um, you know, 50 some years ago. Whatever the trajectory of the airplane, you dropped up on your chart, how do you judge where the bombs are gonna go? We got quite accurate when we got vertical. So the more vertical you are, the more accurate you are. So it's easy to judge straight down because you get an even horizon like this, but also it's where you're gonna hit if you keep doing what you're doing. So it's pretty obvious to judge what you're above. We got very accurate when you get right straight over the target and drop the bombs off and they fall. They just fall right into the target. So we got good at that point too. Now you see the speed brakes. You see those speed brakes, that slows us down. We had to learn about that because without those brakes, you fell faster than the bombs you dropped off and your propeller is eating on your own bombs. Now that is a very bad day when you chewing up on your own bombs. So we had to learn that one. <laughs> so now that's the engine I looked after, 3,000 horsepower. I did electricity, I did instruments, and I ended up being an engine mechanic on that. Now that's a very complex motor, and that's the one I'm looking after. I went exceedingly fast with the Marines, fast. Because I had the creativity of the farm kid, you know, the in my soul understanding of machinery. What is broken? How is this machine doing, and what do I need to do to keep it going? That's the creativity of the farm kid. But I was never creative when I touched the machine. That's got to be exactly the way they taught me or by the book. In maintaining a machine, you have got to keep the machine as it was originally manufactured. If you do something different, it's a new machine and all the tests and all the pedigree of process and all the being right with this thing are out the window. So I was massively creative, but also disciplined, totally disciplined in doing it the right way, my maintenance. So I moved very fast with the Marines. I became a crew chief within two or three months of getting to Korea. The crew chief means I own an airplane. It's Private Musgrave, yes, one stripe. Private Musgrave, this is your airplane. You eat with it, you sleep with it, and it's your airplane. The pilots borrow it from you to go to war. Your airplane. But you coordinate the other maintenance, and you go to the head shed and you put a green check mark and say, this airplane is airworthy, it's flyable and can go. And before you leave, you initial 100 items that you say meet specifications. I did that at the age of 18 with one stripe, Private Musgrave, is certified airplanes to go to war. Now you see the path I'm on. You see the skill set I'm building now along the way. And that's the kid. That's the kid that's certifying your airplanes. So I go to the pilot's lounge, I pick up my pilot and walk them on there looking at them. Thinking, my God, they're getting younger and younger as they go. Now that's my flight line there, and I've got to get it done right, and I also don't have a toolbox. I don't have a toolbox, and those airplanes have never been in a hangar their whole life. <clears throat> I know what a toolbox is. <clears throat> it's a great big red chest. It's red, and it's got all these nice drawers. You pull the drawer out, and here's all the tools. I don't have a toolbox. I have to scrounge tools to get the job done, <clears throat> and I don't have a hangar. I got to work out there in the mud and the muck with my machine. That's where I got to work, and I got to work with a stand. So that's why I'm getting the job done. I got a job, and I got it done right. I left Korea, and we flew off to the aircraft carrier that's going by Mount Fuji with my AD, Douglas AD Sky Raiders. <clears throat> and onto a carrier called a wasp. And you notice it's straight deck. It doesn't have the canned deck. You know these people these days? They got the cable. You know, they hook the airplanes up to this, this steam cable and they throw the airplanes off. It's called a catapult lunge. 
And then we the real folks. So we fly them off. So we the real people, you know. But don't worry, I've updated myself. But that's the USS Wasp that I was on. That is my motor, that is my pilot, and the way that thing goes. And so, and my motor has got to perform. I don't have a dynamometer. My motor got to perform. And if my motor doesn't perform, the pilot's going to end up in the water. We did this too often. That pilot's going to make it out. My brother was on the same carrier the Wasp. He was flying the same AD Sky Raider. He went in the water, but he got run over by the carrier. So my brother died on the same ship that I was on. From the carrier, I went to Kaneohe Bay. That's Oahu, VMA 212. I was in at that time. So I ended up there. Now, just two weeks ago, myself and my 10-year-old daughter, we went there. We were at Kaneo two weeks. I go there all the time. I stay up with the Marine Corps. I go and I work with the Marines. See, that's a skill set I am not ever letting go. And your championships, your MOS, your ACA, what you've done, don't you ever let that go. You take that certification, you take that skill set with you. Wherever you go in life, take it with you. It's part of you, and it's something you got to offer to the world. I hang on to the Marines so that I can stay a Marine, but also so that I can give the Marine Corps spirit to other people, so I can give it to you, the Marine Corps spirit. So I hang on to that skill set. It's part of who I am. It's part of what I can offer to people. So I visited them, but yeah, that's so, that's, that's uh, Kaneohe, Marine Corps Air Station. But I do not have a high school diploma, and so I don't have education, so I have to muster out. And that's Treasure Island, that's Oakland Bay Bridge, you see right there. So I need to leave. I need to leave because I can't go anywhere without some education. So I did have a GED, so I took the GED, but that still wasn't enough to get me into colleges without some education. So I couldn't get into the colleges. But I showed up at Syracuse, and even though I did not get accepted, I showed up anyway. So this is the day when the kids who did get accepted, they show up to go to college. Well, I showed up anyway. And so I'm on the sidewalks, and I'm asking people, I want to study, I want to go here, who do I see? They're looking at me strange, but finally someone told me, it's the dean's office, you go to the dean. I find a dean, I knock on the dean's door, the dean. And I said, sir, I'm a product of child labor. I never finished school. I do have my GED. And you did not take me, but I am ready to go to work. That dean said, of course. He didn't hesitate a microsecond. He's used to all these 4.0 kids. Hey, man, no human being could turn this kid down. The kid's there and the kid wants to go to work, right? So he walked me out front and said, matriculate, take this person. So away we go. So that's one way I made it into college. So there's a different way to do things. You know, it's called don't take no. You don't take no for an answer. So there's different ways to do things. <laughs> now you see this? That is a child gate, which is supposed to stop the kids from going up the stairs. <laughs> so you see. <laughs> no. You take that picture with you, there's another way in life. <laughs> Do not take no for an answer. So you find finding out whose story Musgrave is? Uh, that's who I am, one of them kids climbing outside there. So now this is kind of a terrible slide, but folks, 100% of everything I ever got done in life is only for one way, for one operating system, and that is you get in some situation on August 10th now, your passion, your dreams are going to lead you to take on the next thing in your life, the next mountain you want to climb. It's the next playing field, the rules of the game. And how do I get to the finish line? You must do the details. You must identify those factors that are going to affect your outcome. You have got to do the details. The factors that will influence my getting to the objectives, the finish line. So identify, analyze, dissect. I love the word dissect. It means really dive in and put the energy 
your energy into how this is working and what I got to do. And you control those factors within a range such that they will take you to the finish line. <clears throat> so I got to the university, and that's a terrible slide too, but that's it. You see, they're herding cats. You ever tried to herd a bunch of cats? What you do in life, you're herding a bunch of cats. You gotta get the cats to the finish line. So it's a multiple thing. Whatever you do in life is a system. It's within a whole bunch of other systems. You got to identify the factors. The factors are gonna drive your outcome. And I don't care what you wanna do. That's what you gotta do in life. <clears throat> and so I took that on at the university. And you're gonna see my bird a few other times. But what the bird is telling you, it is that intense look. It is the energy you put into analyzing your situation. The current and future, you look into the future. Nuance is a great word, the intricacies. What is going to, uh, I thank you, sir. It's called coffee with a lot of cream. <laughs> <laughs> it's coffee and a lot of cream. Yeah, it'll be fantastic. So I got the boss here running for coffee. <laughs> so, yeah. And the coldness kind of scares me, as you're going to see later. <laughs> so, yes, I'm eccentric. <laughs> I never aspired to be normal. <laughs> it's not how I got where I got. <laughs> and don't none of you kids aspire for normalcy. No, it's called differentiation. And these kids I'm looking at here, man, you're differentiated kids. Differentiation is key. <clears throat> and so I know Brian, Brian ran to get the coffee. He knows the, he knows the thing. He knows it. So at the university, I got into complex mathematics. I got to herd these cats. I've been trying to survive my whole life. And I found out at the university if you can quantitate these factors, you must control this a math. It's called multivariate statistics and the calculus of complex variables. I know that's terrible stuff, but it's not the way me, farm kid, looking at it. Me, farm kid, is looking at stuff. Man, I got to get a hold of these cats. I got to herd these cats. So I got to deal with all these stupid variables so that I can get to the finish line without getting killed. <clears throat> so that's what I'm into. Now, I love, my, I love the university, but the first week at the university, I'm missing the Marine Corps. I'm missing that spirit to get the job done. Man, get the job done, the spirit. So I went out and joined the active reserve. <clears throat> now the fun thing about what I'm doing in life is every one of you can do. I'm incredibly confidence builder for people because they see I can do what Story did. I can do the Marines, I can do the grease monkey. You know, I can join the active reserve. It's just one step. My whole story for you, as Lakeisha said, it is one step at a time. It's August 10th, what step are you gonna take? <clears throat> so I joined the Marine Corps Active Reserve. <clears throat> now they didn't have any airplanes for me to mess with, but they got tanks. So I drove tanks going through college. I will drive anything, I drive tanks. I said tanks, yeah. But I'm a 20 year old farm kid. You know what a 20 year old farm kid? Peggy Hayes, I love you dearly. <laughs> You know how good she is? <clears throat> Peggy's awesome. Now, so I get distracted all the time. These people, Brian and Peggy and Craig, they're just gorgeous to work with. They're the best team I ever work with. You know, yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> For organization and to helping me to get there and helping me to stay on target and the whole way we're gonna do business. It was outrageous. Okay, I'm a 20-year-old farm kid at this point. I got a tank. You know what that tank got? It's got an 810 horsepower V12. Okay, life is good. Are you starting to find out who I am? It ain't my seven graduate degrees, folks. It's 810 horsepower V12. It's who I am in life. Remember, product of child labor, teenage marine. <clears throat> and that's going to carry me all the way to the telescope. So, and of course, I also drove heavy equipment. I know this stuff. I'm playing to my strengths, kids. Play to your strengths. Do what you're good at. Do what your passion, your dreams, late. I am making so much money going to college. You got this 20-year-old farm kid, and this 20-year-old farm kid is making so much money going to college that I got to spend that money on something. 
the money is just rolling in. <clears throat> so that's what I spent the money on. <laughs> just turned out I got the classical Corvette, a 60 years of Corvette, that's a classical one. So of course I get the Corvette and I gotta work on the Corvette, I gotta drive the Corvette, so it's helping, it's pushing me down the road too. What's all this money stuff? Hmm? Remember the hay bales? Do you remember those lousy hay bales? When I get to be 50 pounds, I have to throw a 50 pound hay bale on the wagon. So I gotta throw hay bales, not just tie the knots. I do that forever. Year after year, thousands and thousands of hay bales, throwing the hay bales. I say, where's the hay bales? You don't think those hay bales are going anywhere. The hay bales went everywhere with me. So, hay bales? Yeah, freshman, I took up wrestling. The rest of the freshmen take up weightlifting to get strong. I am five years ahead of them, and they are not going to catch me. And I'm undefeated throughout high school. I'm an undefeated wrestler. I got to Syracuse University and had a wrestling team. As a freshman, I made the varsity right off and also got a scholarship, room, board, and tuition. The hay bales are paying for the whole thing. Do you understand how life goes? The hay bales pay for all of college, room, board, and tuition. Well, you get the GI Bill from the Marine Corps, too. The GI Bill, and they paying for everything, and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> so I got two people paying for the whole thing. The tanks are paying for the whole thing, and the construction is paying for the whole thing. I'm making four times the money I need to to go to college, and I have to spend it on something. I spend it on that. You getting an idea how to do life? That's the hay bales, man. It's the Marines. You just leverage that past into something. So I took up flying. There is no space program yet. Not yet. It doesn't exist yet. There's no space program when I'm in college. So I don't know where this is going. I take up flying because I like to fly. That's my Beechcraft T-34A in its current colors. I left school. I became a mathematician for East McCodack. And we know where that went. They really missed the information age. But for me, this is way back. This is the mid-1950s. And I am on the ground floor of taking business problems and converting them into mathematics. So I was a mathematician there. But I got to keep moving. I went to UCLA in operations research. That's a horrible slide here. But the kind of math I did was you can manufacture widgets at a certain cost there in Gainesville, Austin, in uh, Phoenix. So you can manufacture a widget at a certain cost there. In these different markets here, you can get this much money for them and you got the transportation costs. The basic question, the mathematical question is how many widgets do I make at each manufacturing plant and how many places do I ship them to? It is an impossible mathematical question, except the kind of math I got into, the transportation models and operation research, I could iteratively move this problem and come up with one optimized solution. So that is what I got into. At UCLA, I'm still working these details. How do you deal with all the different details? I also got into computers. <clears throat> I became an operator, a compiler, and assembler in Fortran on an IBM 409, the most powerful computer in its day. So we're talking 1955 now, donated by IBM. So I got into the computation world here. I don't think anyone in this room understands what a vacuum tube processor is. We won't go there. It's vacuum tubes. The silicon wasn't here yet, magnetic processors and that kind of stuff. But oh my goodness, I, I'm getting, I'm into the computer world. This is in the mid 50s, but I got interested in how the brain works. Computers work this way, well what's going on up here? How does a brain get some of these jobs done that a computer gets done? So I got into this world between computers and the brain. And so it's the passion and the dreams. I cannot leave it alone. I got to go and do that. So it's a big shoe. It's a fork in the road, man. It's a fork in the road. So that's what you get into in life. You think you got a path. You think you're going there, but your passion leads you somewhere else. So I am traveling from the West Coast, UCLA, back to Syracuse to start my pre-med, which I don't have. 
I don't have pre-med, so I got to go back and get my pre-med to go to medical school uh, to pursue the brain. Well, I'm driving from the west coast to the east, and I cross the, uh, I cross the Ohio River up here, and I run into a gorgeous little town, Marietta. It's 200 years old. It's got elms. It's got brick streets. And here's the Muskingum River. It's a junction of two rivers. And it's a gorgeous little town that I get interested in. And my goodness, they got a college here, too. So Marietta College. So I went to admissions. I found an administration building. And I walked in there. I says, do you have pre-med studies in this little place? And yes, we do. And a professor happens to be here today. Why don't you run over and see him? And I said, OK, that's it. So I'm going to go to Marietta College and do my pre-med just as I stopped in this little town going from the West Coast. To, this is totally impulsive thinking. I mean, this is irrational thinking to think I'm going to do my pre-med just because I'm going driving across country and I run into an attractive town. So that's it. I did my pre-med in Marietta College. There's a lot of luck that all this kind of stuff worked out. Okay. So now it's time to apply to the medical schools. And so this is where it happens. I wish in this thing I could put up that I was an MOS or ACA champion. It makes a difference. So the kids were talking about the resume. Akil was talking about that, man. And look, you're talking about your life story. That's my life story that I have to offer to medical school. And it's so important that you invest your work <clears throat> in the skills that you have and you take them to a certain level and you say this is who I am I am certified you can say I am a pilot but do you have a private pilot's license so the certification matters it means that you made the effort to take it to this level and that's where I am and so all of that is incredibly important it's your future <clears throat> but this is what I offered to medical school. I filled out their applications and took all the tests, but I put this sheet on the top, and I said, hey, folks, this is who I am. So you apply to medical school, and you tell them you're a tank mechanic, you're an airplane mechanic. You tell them all this stuff. You're a product of child labor. I got into every single medical school there is, every single one of them. That's what I had to offer. So I'm offering a different skill set. I'm going to get, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to figure the brain out, I'm going to fix it. Well, the medical schools know he is not going to figure the brain out, and he's not going to fix it, but he thinks he is. And so that's important. But you see, this is a differentiated, I am not a 4.0 student, never was. And I don't know how I did in the test, I don't care, that's who I am. That is a differentiated resume that you're offering to the world. And so... <clears throat> That got me into medical school. And I ended up going to Columbia. I had incredible interviews there, and I loved the city. I'm a farm kid, but I got into the electricity of New York City. I said, man, this is, this is one funny place. You know, but I just fell in love with it. New York City, wow. So that's Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center you see right there. <clears throat> so I ended up there. I'm going to class the first, the first day and I see on the door, Neurosurgical Research Lab. I says, that's me. Neurosurgeon, that sounds like me. You knock on the door, I want to work here. And the guy's looking at me like, well, who are you? A freshman medical student. We don't have those in here. We have postdoc fellows, and we have surgeons. I says, but, you know, I'll figure this place out. You know, I drive tanks, sir. I'm an airplane mechanic, I'm a product of child labor. I'll figure this place out. <laughs> He's looking at me funny. OK, I'll work for nothing. <clears throat> I'll wash the bottles, clean the floors. <clears throat> I'll work for nothing. You're hired. And so that fella I'm talking to, he's a neurophysiologist, but ended up being a dean at Einstein Medical School for 27 years, this person I'm talking to. I figured this place out. <clears throat> I figured that lab out. I got after these brain cells. I was so radically pragmatic that I did stuff other people couldn't do. The professors didn't take the same approach. The postdoc fellows didn't take the same approach. <clears throat> I figured out all the electrodes. I figure out the manipulators. I got there when they couldn't because I'm bringing that strange skill set of mechanics figured out and get the job done, get to that finish line. So I was publishing papers <coughs> as a freshman. I published five papers, and from that point on, 
every single paper that came in the lab, I published. So I got accepted as a neurosurgical resident at Columbia my sophomore year, five years earlier than I should have. Normally, got to finish medical school, finish internship, general surgery. So <clears throat> I offered something different. I did things a different kind of way. <clears throat> yes, I did take this up during medical school. I don't need any all those skeptical looks you see on the faces <laughs> I'm looking out there. It's going to be okay. I took this up medical school. I like to fall, so Lakewood Sport Parachuting Center. But it is another field for me to figure it out, get it done, and get it done right. Configuration control procedures checklist. I brought my family with me. I brought, they went through the classes. They're totally confident, you know. <clears throat> It's called interact with the community. I became a public parachutist where I'm looking at the way everyone does it. I'm picking off the best practices from everybody I see. I'm inviting everyone, look at how I'm doing it. Can I do it better? How would you do it? So I built a configuration. I built procedures and checklists by listening to other people. And I was dead serious about proficiency and training and configuration control. <clears throat> and this is the way I'm going to do it, and it's called porosity. You became a porous person where the whole information flows in and out of you. You bring it in and you put it out. It's called porosity. <clears throat> There's where I trained, Lakewood Sport Parachuting Center. I started in 61 when a sport just came here uh, from France. He said, how could you do this still? I'm worried about leaving this mecca of parachuting when geographically I leave medical school. When I left, they had 300,000 jumps and zero fatalities. It's acceptable statistic. It's zero in 300,000. The odds are not zero, but that's the statistics I'm dealing with. <clears throat> I finished medical school. Where am I gonna do my general surgery training before I get into the brain surgery? As a teenager going across the country, I ran into Lexington, Kentucky and the horse farms. As a teenager, I wanted to be a farmer. There is no space program. I just want to be a farmer. Well, if I got to be a farmer, this is the kind of farmer I want to be. <clears throat> I haven't got the money to own any of it, but I'm going to run a horse farm. So that's my dream. That's my aspiration as a teenager. I'm going to run a horse farm. So I love the place and I said, the next time in whatever career path I end up on, I'm going to make it back when I can to Lexington, Kentucky and do the horse farms. The horse farms are totally related now, totally unrelated to my medical education. But I said, my goodness, I'm leaving medical school and I promised myself I would go back to Lexington when I could. So it was the horse farms that drove me from where I'm going to do my internship. This is totally insane. It's totally impulsive thinking. It's just how could you possibly do this? <clears throat> but I went to University of Kentucky Medical Center for my internship. I was in the first. It's a brand new school. And it was the very first internship class there. <clears throat> I ran into this fellow here, Ben Eisman. He was the chief of surgery, brand new department. I did not know it, but he was an international expert on military medicine that is trauma out in the military field. It's MASH, but it's even before MASH, how you look at badly hurt people out there in the field. He was an incredible, inspiring mentor. I have had incredibly great mentors my own entire life. He was an inspirational leader. <clears throat> and so as soon as I had my, that's it, folks, it's over. I'm coming here. Well, in the internship matching programs, you're not allowed to commit to a school, and they are not allowed to tell you they have accepted you. But I'm leaving my interview with this man and going out the door, and he says, story. Yes, sir. I like Marines. Okay, I got that message. And I turned and looked at him, and I said, I like horses. So that's the way we told each other where we're going. I canceled all the rest of my interviews, and I came here, and he's going to be part of <clears throat> my future, as you're going to see, for 30 years. Well, it's not totally related, but it's so important when uh, I don't know how to go back. Do I know how to go back? Should I try going back? Red arrow. Yes. 
I parked in the parking lot to go in here and to get my interview, and I was listening to the radio. It was a little bit of music and local news, uh, just to get a feel for Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, so, um, you know, I didn't turn the radio off. I turned the car off. I went in and did my interview. When I came back out, and I turned the ignition of the car on, President Kennedy was dead. It just, <clears throat> when I left the car and I left the radio, that's the way the world was. I went my, and did my interview, I came back out and turned the ignition and Kennedy was dead. So it happened, you know, that's a lot. It happened during the interview. I can't forget that part. So I'm in my surgical training, I'm gonna be a neurosurgeon. <clears throat> But oh my goodness, National Academy of Sciences and NASA. I read in Science Magazine where they're gonna fly formally trained scientists in space. And I looked at that and I said, don't do that to me, leave me alone. I mean, said, come on, leave me alone. I am in trying to grow up. I am trying to stick with anything, something. You know what I mean? Don't do this to me, but it looked like it's gonna happen. I said, oh my goodness, here we go. You know, it's another big fork in the road, but <laughs> it's okay. If I get this job, <clears throat> if it will utilize, it'll leverage everything I've ever done in the past. So now what do you do? You're on something and you see something new happening. Do you hang on to what you have until you know you can do the next thing? Well, that's a serious question. I don't, I leap off and go. So I told my poor boss, it, you know, I was scrubbing with him one day. I told him at the end of the year, I won't be with you anymore, sir. And he said, golly, why, where are you? I'm going into space, sir. He says, how can I help? Okay, he didn't call me in that case. He says, how can I help? So I went back into postdoc fellowship, aerospace medicine. I got a graduate degree in biological physics. I took up soaring, seriously soaring. I started, got real serious. I have been flying for a decade now, and I took real serious about, I did air shows in my Belanca decathlon. This is the toughest job I've ever had in my whole life. It's discipline, it's procedures, it's checklists, it's hard on the body, hard on the mind, but you gotta do it and you gotta follow the rules. Uh, so that really matured. So I'm getting ready uh, for the space program. I took a minor in aeronautical engineering, of course I took that, and so th this lab here, I'm in this graduate course in, in aeronautics and we have to come up with a student project. So the student project I came up with is the aerodynamics of the free falling human body. So I was able to take my parachute and sport and get it into, we did research on that and determine what the aerodynamics of free fall in the human body was. So I was able to take a sport and do some real research and we were the first people in the world to ever do that. And it's very primitive here, that's what I was looking like back then. I have no stories to tell you, everything worked out. And so parachuting, I did it right. I did get accepted into the NASA program, that's the Johnson Spacecraft Center that you're looking at, and I joined before we got flying Apollo and Saturn. Now my boss, he moved from Kentucky at the same time I left Kentucky, and he became chairman at Denver General Hospital in Denver. In Denver, we had a class one trauma center. We had the whole city. There was no other trauma center. My boss missed me, my pragmatic of get the job done. So he said, Story, if you can break away from NASA for just three days a month, I will turn you into the world's best trauma surgeon. I says, my goodness, give it to me, baby. Yes, I'm gonna be a trauma surgeon now. <clears throat> but it fit, it's the NASA model if someone gets hurt out there and I can bring airspace procedures more readily to that field than something else. So, for the next 26 years, NASA wants me to stay proficient in science, too. 26 years, I was a trauma surgeon in Denver General Hospital. Well, this is a recent picture. It's not an old picture, which I don't have. I didn't like what was happening in the emergency room. When a badly hurt patient comes in, no one's doing anything. They're waiting for instructions from the doctor and the doctor's focused on where the patient's hurt. That's a very complicated process. So nothing's happening and the patient dies because it's in action. Well, I got thinking a little different. When a NASCAR Indy car comes in there, the record is change four tires in 2.4 seconds. It's automated, you just get on with a job and do it. 
It's trained and it's proficient. The procedure's 2.4 seconds. You got four tires changed. I'm looking at this kind of operation and I'm saying, what parts of this automation can I bring to trauma surgery? So, I automated trauma surgery. I only want two things. Instead of where we hurt, I need two things, folks. Oxygenated blood flow to the brain and to the heart. I don't want anything else. I'm gonna save your life and then I'll put you back together where you're hurt. You see, I changed the outcome. <clears throat> I made the outcome simple. And bottom line, you're a plumber. You're not a doctor, you're not a nurse, you're a plumber. I'm gonna plumb gas and I'm gonna plumb fluid. And you get in there and plumb things. I want you to plumb things. So, that's the scheme I came up with. You got a physiological monitor, it says how we doing, you winning or losing? You stop the blood flow, you pump stuff in, you oxygenate it, and you're the pharmacologist. So, patient comes in, boom. Blue person, blue checklist on the wall. Blue equipment, yellow, yellow checklist there, bang. When my patients get in, bang, that team is on them just like an NASCAR pit crew. And I save lives. I never lost anyone except for brain injury. I saved a life. I stabilized the critical aspects, and then we went to fix the rest of the problems. So that's a little look <clears throat> how you take things. So what you gonna do with this? Do you see the relationship now between what you do between NASCAR pit crew and an emergency room? Those folks, you got the color coding, they're proficient, they're trained, it's automated, you're gonna launch things, and that's what you do in life. And so it's an incredible inspiration. So for every one of you, I can ask you, what are you going to do with that? How do you take that kind of perfection and bring it into your lives? So that's the multiple platform <clears throat> that kind of thinking. I continue to teach <clears throat> a physiology at UK, University of Kentucky, to keep myself sharp in it. Well, NASA going to send me to the Air Force because I don't have jet training and I don't have military wings. I was enlisted in the Marines. I'm a very experienced pilot but I don't have military wings and I could never afford jets. They're gonna send me to the Air Force. So I said, my goodness, you're sending a Marine to the Air Force who already has the PhD in aviation called Airline Transport Rating. We are. I could have had a bad attitude, but I did not. <clears throat> I said, give it to me, baby. Oh my goodness, it's Air Force University. I want it, give me the whole thing and don't change the curriculum. Okay, I don't want, I'm not gonna exempt the word exempt. The kids brought it, exempt. I don't want to be exempt from anything. Give me the whole thing. You see that attitude? <clears throat> Give me the whole thing that I need. <clears throat> so where we went, here's the airplanes I had. And I continue to do the Air Force. I did the Air Force last month. I went to the Air Force. I looked at the current curriculum, the current things. I want to hang on to that Air Force so that I can bring it to other people. I'm Air Force, I'm gonna be Air Force. I'm Marine, okay. Hang on to every skill that you ever acquired because you are going to use it in your future. So I finished up in this T-38 with the Air Force and went on to the NASA one. I did help NASA with a paint job. You see the paint job a little different here. <clears throat> so now when I went back to NASA, we half the squadron was T-38s and half was T-33s. If you got your choice, you know, do you want to fly this or do you want to fly that? Every other astronaut is flying the slick one, not Story Musgrave, not me. I want to get certification in T-33. I want to be a T-33 pilot in addition to T-38. It broadens my skill set. It broadens my flying skills. It's not just sleek and fast and good looking. You know, it's proficiency. I want to broaden my base. So I spent all my time in that airplane there. <clears throat> and I flew all over the country looking like this. So this is a 1948 antique. But you gotta pay attention to the basics, the essentials. And of course, this nowadays it takes that to do the same kind of job. I continue to work on airplanes. <clears throat> I worked on airplanes. I'm gonna go fly. I stop in a hangar and I see him working on some system I don't understand. So I continue to work on airplanes. And there's some system I need, I'd call him ahead. When you're working on this, show me. I learned airplanes by taking them apart and putting them back together, totally different. I was the maintenance, I became the maintenance test pilot for NASA in the T-38. 
that is heavy maintenance, pieces all over the floor, when they put it back together, I'm the one that flies it to see that it works. Of course, because I am an airplane mechanic and my outlook on things is mechanics. And that's why I understand things. Taking them apart and putting them back together. Now, so I carried a camera every time. My camera was with my parachute. When I went to fly this airplane, I carry a camera. I don't know where that's going. It's a beautiful airplane, it's going to take me to great places. Well, after decades <clears throat> of shooting this thing, I says, my goodness, with all the photographs, I'm going to do a book. I'm going to do a book on this airplane. So, me and the mechanics down at Kennedy Space Center, we, I want T-38s now. We arranged them here because the launch is going to be there, see. I want a nice backdrop, so I know I'm doing a book. So the backdrop is a night launch, and it's lighting up my babies. So, and I also did this in the daytime. Look what this plume, look what the rocket plume is going to do. <clears throat> The rocket plume's going to, that rocket plume's going to turn into this. Don't you dare say Photoshop. This is STS-117 that did this. <laughs> so I got sunset, the sun is cooperating, I got this. The plume turned into this an unbelievable picture for my book, shooting the T-38s. So what's the lesson I got for you? Get on the playing field and get ready, folks. My camera was with my parachute. When I got in that airplane, I had my camera. You can't look ahead and say it's going to be a boring flight and there won't be anything to take a picture of. Now, get on a playing field and get ready because life happens and surprises are going to happen. <clears throat> the most powerful rainbow I ever saw in my face. I landed the T-38 on a Sunday out there. That's why there's no people. They're at home. The most powerful rainbow I saw. So that's in my book. Get on the playing field and get ready because... It's going to be unknown. <clears throat> unknown stuff happens out there, and there's my book. So I didn't know NASA, and I got into spacewalking right away with NASA. I got into spacewalking because I'm a mechanic. Spacewalking means you're going to work out there, so you got work to do. So it's tools, and it's getting work done. So obviously, you look at the total career I had of mechanics and getting the job done, but the other magic about the spacewalking was I am a physician. I know the anatomy, the ergonomics of work. I know the metabolism of work. And the other thing is my physiology degree. Your physiology in a closed inside that suit is what the suit giving you. It controls your temperature. It gives you the gas to breathe. It takes out the carbon dioxide. So the physiology of a closed loop system and the ergonomics I was able to bring my medical training and my physiological training into this. <clears throat> so I even got into Apollo training on the way to the moon. We landed on the moon. I helped to construct the spacewalk to save the Skylab program. You see that little shield we put? It lost a bunch of equipment during launch. That's a Skylab, so Skylab, I built a lot of the spacewalks. I communicated them onto the shuttle program, and of course, I helped develop uh, the space suit that we're going to use on the shuttle program, also use on space station. So I was on Challenger's first flight, and I got to do the first shuttle spacewalk because as a designer, as an engineer, as a spacewalker, I designed the suit. So I got to go and test that suit. <clears throat> and of course, I flew other missions, <clears throat> but I ended up being assigned to telescope in 1975. So I've been looking after Hubble Space Telescope for 40 years now. But they told me in 75, you're going to be the, you're going to be the doctor for the Hubble Space Telescope. You identify every failure it can get into, and you come up with a spacewalk and tools and procedures to fix it. So starting in 75, 18 years before I went up there to fix it, I was designing the telescope itself for serviceability and maintainability identify every possible problem can happen and how you're going to fix it with a spacewalk. And you know why I got that job. You look at my history of mechanics and figuring stuff out and fixing it. But I got to fix stuff looking like this. Very bulky, not got the same body I got. Uh, so a lot more difficult and free fall. But I have to design, identify the failures, and come up with spacewalk and tools and procedures to fix it and fix it looking like this. So it gets down to the bird again. How much energy are you going to put in it? Current and future, the nuanced intricacies of failures, causes, and consequences. 
it's what's going to fail. What caused the failures, what is the consequences of the failure, and how do you recover the whole system? So again, decades and decades for Story Musgrave, I'm having to look at the details of why I got this job. Now, at first, I have nothing to play with. I got nothing physical at all to play with, so they built me a balloon telescope. So I, I blew up this balloon. So I have a balloon telescope, and it's a balloon story, too. It is a balloon story. And so so I, that's, that's playing. It's test, I'm testing my procedures, and all finally I got in a water tank, uh, which is not a great simulator. If I go upside down in the water, I'm carrying 170 pounds on my collarbone, so the suit doesn't work the way, but the water is good for this. If I put 30 pounds of force in here, that's coming back on me. It's Newton. Whatever force I put into some object I'm working on, it comes back on me. So I have to manage the force that comes back <clears throat> to myself, to restrain myself. Hubble down at KSC, launched that thing. I did not carry it up there, but I was in mission control. Within months, we found out we had the wrong mirror in the telescope. You go to Google and you look at internet, and so it's Hubble Mirror Accident Report you will find out how not to live a life and how not to do business, what zero quality is. No supervision, no communication, no procedure, no nothing. This was criminal negligence. It wasn't a mistake, it's called criminal negligence. They put the wrong mirror in, in the telescope. So I gotta deal with that now, too. So now I have a mission. I'm not working every possible fair. I got 13 things that are broke. You go work that. Well, in the middle of getting ready for the Hubble mission, they sent me the citation. This is a story, you gotta do citations. We want to examine whether we can augment our airplane fleet, have half T-38s and half citations. Okay, give it to me, baby, I'll do that. Uh, so give me the citation. <clears throat> so all you do is give yourself over, flight safety man, here I am, give it to me, baby. And so you just go all the way through and it's 100% simulator. The first time you ever see an airplane is your check ride. It's a check ride, so you gotta get certified, right? It's again, it's a certification. It's a type rating to fly passengers in a citation. But the magic of this is it's all 100% simulator. And so you keep going through life. Focus and concentration, this is what it's all about. And you get in the water tank and you go through the procedures you're gonna do. <clears throat> Not a great simulator, but it helps. I always empower the people around me. I empower the people around me to come up with better ideas. Before I get in a tank with these safety drivers, can you show me a better way to do things? I did the same thing in surgery. I never did any procedure in medicine without telling the whole room, I need to know you're comfortable with what we're doing. Anyone that's uncomfortable, so it's teamwork. It's ask the people to give you a better solution. Are you comfortable with what I'm doing? And so she will help you, you know, if you allow her to. I trained in the Smithsonian Museum. I went to the Smithsonian because now the Hubble's flying. I do not have a mock-up down here guaranteed to have same measurements. The engineering qualification unit got the same measurements. I took all my tools and I took my instruments and I installed them in the Smithsonian to see the fit and function <clears throat> that they would work. Tomorrow I'm gonna go in a vacuum chamber, going in the vacuum chambers at flight temperatures. So in the vacuum, at the anticipated temperatures, that will be the highest fidelity test I can do. And so Hubble, very complicated mission. They may be running 100, minus 150 Fahrenheit. The magic, the real question is, they give me enough Mother Earth. If you will give spacewalk on enough Mother Earth, you'll be 59 Fahrenheit, because the average temperature of Earth, you know, day, day night, and winter, summer, is 59, I'll be that. The blackness of space is three degrees Kelvin, minus 480, so you can't do that. So you trade off the heat of the sun and the blackness and the earth, but I need Mother Earth. Well, it's a very complicated mission, so how are you gonna point the shuttle during my spacewalk? I need, they wouldn't give me enough Mother Earth. The vacuum, they did the right test, but they just, I kept telling them it won't work. Well, they may be going to do the test anyway. <clears throat> so I did the test, my fingers stung so bad. So yes, I got a bad case of frostbite. I didn't have enough shielding, enough insulation. That is your lead spacewalker's hand six months before flight. I got eight dead fingers and off to Alaska. <clears throat> and the world's frostbite expert. But now, in my choreography of how the body gonna work and the tools, I gotta work on how much flesh I'm gonna have. I can shorten the gloves, you know, if my fingers get shorter. But I not only gotta go get this mission done, 
I got to plan for how much flesh I'm going to have. So I was working back in a suit. Said, "Story, you can't get in a suit with hands like that." I have no choice, folks. I have no choice. Okay, we got to keep going forward. Uh, so that's what we did. I went to fly this mission, toasty warm. We got the problem. We fixed the problem. We got me spacewalker. The plan for the mission is warm. So away we go. You get permission to fly by, and it's just fantastic. You fly that beautiful ship uh, by your shuttle, and the bird's eye view. And your vehicle came across the desert and stacked that vehicle up. You're going to get this PowerPoint. And so Surdy Point's got this PowerPoint, but Story Musgrave a hot meal. Send these particular pictures. I'll send you this PowerPoint. Take a sunset there. Now, Troy, dear, me and him, we went on the journey for 30 years. He's my suit tech. He looks after all my equipment, the gloves, the helmet, the suit, all the rest of that. He strapped me in everything, starting with Apollo and Skylab, every shuttle, the vacuum chambers. So away we go. I like that one because there's only nature in the background. We're going to go fix that thing. A Hubble spotted Hubble from 6,000 miles away. Finally, after 18 years, got in the back of the bus, getting ready to go out and work. But I got to put up with this kind of stuff, but it doesn't bother me. Of course, we deserve it. The wrong mirror and the other things that failed. But it's not part of my equation. I'm happy with a plan. I'm happy with a dance. I'm going to go do it. I did, did train with Dorothy Hamill on how you do spacewalks. Dorothy, yeah. A spacewalk is an athletic event. You need to see it's an athletic event. I got a body and I got tools, and what do I do? It's every inch, it's every finger, it's every toe. And so I brought the perfection of the athletes who had perfected this for thousands of years. It's going on in Rio today. The perfection of that. You take that now to the spacewalking world, which is new, and you perfect the spacewalking. <clears throat> and so, of course, I got my inspiration from this horse secretary, Claiborne Farmers, Paris, Kentucky. You rub the horse all over you, it's for you that I go forward. You're my inspiration. So, folks, that's what you sign up for. This is not horse racing. It's not space flight. Every one of you, you say, that's me. And that's how good I'm going to be. So, after 18 years of working on a telescope, uh, there I am. But here is the real team. They're the real firm. They know more about what's going on than I do. I want their help. It's not leave me alone, let me do my thing. No, I want them up there with me. I want them over my shoulder. That's why I was able, putting in the optical bench, able to fix for the mirror. That 800-pound camera you see brings you the big pictures. The solar rays were horrible things. They shook so bad, the solar rays would go in the sun. They'd expand and shake. They go in the nighttime, and they contract and shake. What was the problem with the solar rays? A solar array converts sun energy to electricity. They didn't test them in the sun. Solar array, you got to test that thing in the sun. So I went to close these doors. That latch is down here, and that latch is up there. The latches didn't match, so I couldn't close the doors. Got back in the ground and asked them, what's with the doors, folks? They said, story, we couldn't close them on the ground either. But I need to know about that. I'm up there, you see. So they aligned them, then closed them. But I had to come along. You know, back on the farm, to come along, the straps and the wrench, I had two come-alongs on the shuttle to close shuttle doors. I asked flight director, got one of them. I took care of that problem. <clears throat> so there she is. And there's Hubble talking to President Clinton. It's melancholy and sadness. It's sadness. I don't come for the victory in life. It's August 10th. It's who am I August 10th? It's the next mountain I got to climb. But it's sadness because I lost my baby. I lost Hubble, and I'm done with Hubble. A quick look at photography. I'm shooting air. That's the air that you breathe. There's the pyramids of space before we come home. That's a solar eclipse, the moon lying over the sun. I take that picture, but then I turn toward Mother Earth, and there is the eclipse on Earth. That's the shadow of the eclipse there. So we take a sunset and come home <clears throat> and finish up here. The Mediterranean is absolutely gorgeous tonight. This is what it looks like out the window. Flying through the roar, this is what the view. And so home, sweet home, we come into Florida this time. You think about all the people right that did everything great. How was Humble doing? That's before I fixed it and after I fixed it. The first thing that I saw, well, thanks. <clears throat> and of course, uh, you see how we got here now. You see how we got here. It's the details. It's one step, at, life is one step at a time. That's all. That's before I fixed it. The bright star that spread out, and then there's the star after. Uh, so, 
Uh, Hubble's had its 25th anniversary last year. I was able to meet up with a team. I met up with the Nobel Prize winners that won the Nobel. So today, <clears throat> as Greg said, I am a professor at Art Center College of Design. I do teach personal development. I teach aircraft design. I work for Applied Minds. You know about this. I've helped develop the Orion, and when we had a constellation program, I teach excellence, excellence every second of the day, and I teach the evolution of people, the evolution of the companies they work for. And so it's multiple domain thinking. It's the total skill set you have. Now, you see the combination of computers and the brain. Intel asked me to come to them and tell them what the future of the world was. I says, I can't do that. Intel, the future of the world, I'll fall on my face. Musgrave, get your butt out here and tell us something. So I came up with a painting. I painted this picture of the arising of complexity. Every one of you is doing this. So there's the nervous system, of course, that I ended up with, the silicon system, and a tighter and tighter connection then. That is what is happening. So my key question, when you go through life, say, what am I going to do with this? How can I take this and put it over there? Now, Magic Leap, who I work for now, two years ago, we could have a shark swimming over a table, totally virtual. There's the shark swimming around. You could move your head and stay there, move your eyes, and you could walk around the table. And so we are dealing with virtual reality, augmented reality, and all those kind of things there. But you see how I got involved in that. I'm a neurophysiologist. Uh, so I'll finish up here. This is my palm farm. So I run a palm farm. I grow trees, play to your strengths. I know how to grow stuff. That's who I am, a farm kid, I know how to do that. And so I'm a landscape designer, <clears throat> and here's some of the landscapes that I produce. You see, this is your front yard looking at that. I do run the same farm all I did 70 some years ago, not the identical, but I went to eBay, so I got the same thing. For $2,000, I got a, a tractor, just like I did, it brings you back that far. So here's a little story, she's 10, now, but she's been riding this equipment since age two weeks. And so she been, you know, and that's it, folks. So you look at a kid, what experiences do you want to give them? Now, when she got to be two months, I took her car seat and I strapped it to the top of this excavator right there. So she's been riding that since two months. Why no picture? Mom says this is not normal. And if I see a picture of this, I end up in trouble. So I still maintain my equipment, I operate equipment today. I'm gonna to do that with me. So that's the little sweetie. <clears throat> and at the age of seven, she said, she's more precocious. She drove two John Deere's, two Kubotas. Uh, that's what she does in life. But see, she's learning engineering skills. She's learned her judgment. Uh, people complain about no shoes. Well, I can't keep shoes on her. I cannot keep shoes on her. She's a no-shoe girl. I send her out with shoes, but the shoes end up there. It's okay, the dog, the dog doesn't have shoes either, so that's okay. Now the dog, Story got good judgment. Her name's Story Musgrave too. The dog goes out with her. If Story comes back without the dog, I have to ask how her driving was. Because the dog says, maybe this is not a nice place to be today. And so she's a dirt girl, she's a creature girl. We birthed this butterfly and it stayed with her for its whole life. That butterfly never left Story for 30 days. She had to put it in a cage to go to school. And so she does the animals and squirrels. This is just what experiences do you want to give her? She's a hot air balloonist now, and so who knows? She and I are in line to go fly an X going to fly in Virgin Galactic. I don't know if they'll let someone that young. So in finishing up with Walter Cronkite's story, what can you say about an adventure? Three things. I am privileged to have had all the, all the opportunities that I have the incredible opportunities, the meaningful challenges. Second, I was allowed to finish the job. I could have been stopped. And so space flight is the quest for the universe. What is our place in it? What does it mean to be a human? Who are we? The little speck. Yes, Saturn backlit, that speck is us. We are on a cosmic journey. That little speck is Mother Earth. And this is Earth from three billion miles away. And that's the plane that formed the solar system, the planets, you and I. So, for all of you, I wish you well on the journey. Be the best you can every second of the day. Continue that quest for me. With your head and heart in the heavens, your feet solidly on Mother Earth, I wish you well on the journey. And remember, you take it simply because the opportunity is there. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.